hayalperestlerin, risk alanların, denemekten korkmayanların cesaretinden doğduk. Bizi asla yarı yolda bırakmayan o sesin rehberliğiyle ilerlemeye ve öğrenmeye devam ediyoruz. Bunun için varız. Bu yüzden gece geç saatlere kadar lambalarımız sönmez. Elveda demek hem hüzün hem de gurur verir. Her şeyi sorgulayarak ve merakımızı besleyerek, dayanıklılığımızı test ederek... Sınırlarımızı aşarak, ilerleyerek ve yeni ufuklar açarak yeni bir yol buluruz. Yeni icatlar çıkararak kendi yolumuzu çizerek. Burası fikirlerin doğduğu ve yeni fikirleri doğduğu, bizim de doğduğumuz, birlikte büyüdüğümüz ve yükseldiğimiz yer. Burası Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi. Good afternoon, dear participants. This is the second day, second session of the third international conference on Cyprus issue, environmental challenges and energy security. In this session, we will be hosting Professor Erdin Bozkurt, Professor Dilber Uzun Özçayin, Professor Cannur Bozkurt, and Professor Mohsen Sheikh Holas Lami. Uh, our first speaker in this session is Professor Cannur Bozkurt. Uh, we are particularly grateful to her. Uh, she's not feeling very well, uh, but she's here with us. But I think she's having some problems with uh, her voice. So from our audience, uh, we would appreciate if you can uh, turn the volume a uh, little up uh, for listening to Professor Janner's presentation. Professor Janner, welcome. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I, I try to do my best to keep my voice at a hearable level, but uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation for this uh, very, let's say, well-designed uh, event, uh, and would like to do a little correction that since I don't have any academic background, uh, I'm not a professor, in fact, I'm just an uh, engineer uh, with some degrees in the market. <laughs> so today, uh, I very briefly would like to present it to you why geothermal can be a game-changing resource through a sustainable future uh, and play really a key role and a guiding role in the energy transition uh, period. Uh, Mustafa Bey, are you controlling the slides? Yes, I will be sharing your presentation, uh, Professor, uh, yeah. Madam. Thank you. So, if we, uh, I mean, my name is John Robolskort. I am the managing director of uh, NR Change Turkey, uh, and we are providing services to the market uh, for project management uh, and acting in the dissemination for the benefits of geothermal resources. So today what I would like to share with you is that geothermal in fact is not a, a new resource for us. If we can go to the second slide, then you can see the brief history of uh, all renewable energy resources. And within this, uh, from the Paleolithic ages, you can see that we, the humanity, have been utilizing uh, and gaining benefits from the geothermal energy. As soon as coming to the first century, there has been some low technic solutions uh, proposed to the communities to utilize geothermal resources, including carrying natural hotspots, the flutes, through the uh, trees to their uh, living environments. Till the Industrial Revolution, uh, geothermal keeps being one of the main uh, sources for the human beings. However, after this uh, Industrial Revolution, there has been a focus on the conventional or fossil fuels. Uh, and then geothermal, unfortunately, stepped back a little in the uh, development stages of the resource. However, still in 
uh, mid 70s, we were capable to have drill uh, our first hot water wells. And coming today, up today, we see that now we are in the geothermal decade. And there's an increasing interest. There's an increasing worldwide interest in investments, not only limited with R&D studies, but also in the other application areas uh, to uh, increase attention and uh, implementation of the geothermal resources. So coming to the third slide, I very briefly would like to share with you what are these innovative studies in developing technologies. Uh, within the international standards of the exploration approach uh, for geothermal resources, of course, geoscience is a very important discipline. So to find the resource and make the discovery, we need all geological, geophysical, geochemical uh, techniques uh, to understand the subsurface uh, and to make it more uh, scalable and to decrease the uh, range of our uh, sensitivity of the collecting data sets, let's say, uh, there has been so much uh, developing technologies within these fields. Uh, but we can count within these are like the softwares, uh, having the capability processing more data sets in a more integrated manner and in a faster way. Uh, we can use drone technologies uh, to decrease the time of the mapping of large areas. And even with the developing technology, we can um, identify many, many features from mineralization to the anomalies and the, sub, um, the thickness of the soil. Uh, and so many required information for our studies can be uh, supplied by the applying the drone recording uh, visualize, visual, visualizations. In the geophysics, especially for uh, monitoring the uh, or having the picture of the subsurface uh, and to make, for instance, seismic or MT studies more scalable, uh, there are companies working to uh, manufacture lighter equipments uh, plus developing uh, more specific uh, and high quality monitoring equipments and for sure involving all the AI applications to these developments, uh, as well as in the geochemistry studies, increasing uh, uh, to increase the efficiency by utilizing, for instance, different secondary fluids for the uh, geothermal uh, energy production, especially for the environments where you have uh, lack of some of the elements, especially in the hydrothermal systems or for the enhanced uh, developing enhanced engineered deep geothermal systems. In the next slide, you can see uh, what's happening in the drilling side of the story. Again, I believe that AI studies will bring um, a new approach uh, to be able to drill deeper with more control and with uh, less technical issues. But it's not only AI, but uh, there are also companies developing technologies to drill deeper, faster and cheaper by manufacturing uh, or investing in new type of uh, drilling design or BHA structures uh, with new tools and new methodologies of drill pits like microwave drilling or uh, rocket blowing drilling, things like that. In the next slide, you can see that Innovation, in, in fact, is not only limited with uh, uh, providing or making, creating a new product on the desk, but it is also uh, it can be determined uh, in the, within the business models. So if you look at the exploitation of the geothermal resources, also this is the situation in Turkey that we use hydrothermal systems and conventional methodologies. Uh, so what we do is we look for a heat source, we look for a geothermal fluid, uh, sufficient pressure, hopefully, if not utilizing pumps, and producing this geothermal fluid or steam to generate pipe power under different uh, type of technologies of the power plants. But going back, uh, going forward to the next slide, 
uh, we also see that the developing area to harvest more heat and uh, feel geothermal resources uh, as our biggest supporter against this uh, effort to keep climate changes under control. Uh, we are now working how we can generate uh, energy and heat uh, where we don't have this uh, elements of the hydrothermal systems. So they're here, uh, EGS, Advanced Geothermal Systems and Advanced Geothermal Systems comes into the story. So what these uh, technologies do is you are looking for a uh, non-permeable rock, for instance, but which has a, a high heat generation, this we can call this hot dry rocks, and you generate uh, a secondary permeability or an artificial reservoir within these environments. You inject whatever fluid you would like to transfer the heat and produce from the other, either in an open loop manner or a closed loop manner. The reason uh, the importance of this situation is because of our energy consumption I mean, uh, for the sustainability of the humanity on earth we need to control our outputs uh, when we are uh, generating energy for our lives so if you see that almost 40 percent of the global energy uh, is used by buildings and it is not only limited with energy and emissions to generate energy and to utilize this we also use water uh, so geothermal energy can be a solution for heating and cooling to secure agricultural production and also can decarbonize especially the top industries with a very high carbon footprint so how geothermal does this it's a unique resource that you can implement either integrated or cascade several implementations depending on the capacity uh, and the temperature of your reservoir. So as soon as you have a uh, cascade or in integrated manner projects, the only carbon footprint of this life cycle assessment goes to the first project you generate, create, developed, and the others uh, in line with using the re-injection uh, energy, brine, fluid, whatever of the system becomes uh, almost negative zero uh, in through their uh, commercial lifetime. And going back, I mean, to the, uh, yeah, and here you can see the uh, basic cascade applications which you can add one to another. And in the specific of silence, I, Cyprus, uh, I mean, besides power generation and heating and cooling application, I believe that uh, for the desalination purposes, geothermal can be a, a real um, strength, strong tool uh, to secure uh, to access to the fresh water for the uh, local people of the island. If we can see the next slide here, we witnessed a comparison between different energy resources including the renewables and the conventional ones. And here we see that geothermal power plants uh, really generate power with a uh, considerably far high uh, capacity factor. What we say about if I need to determine the capacity factor, let's say, uh, in mathematical terms, it is the total energy produced by a power generation plant in a certain period of time. Uh, that is divided by the energy it can produce at full capacity. So you see here that the capacity factor of the geothermal power plants, which is written as GPP at the top, is leading with 60%. And if you look at the graph, you see that no matter the installed capacity, the data is limited by the Turkey, by the way. Um, in spite of the uh, 1.7% limited installed capacity comparing within the other resources. Uh, it provides more sustainable and continuous power generation. So then we can say also, going to the next slide, then we are now facing a challenge 
uh, and trying to change our energy resources to more uh, green versions of them for a sustainable earth. Uh, so uh, why not uh, geothermal? I mean, it's a resource with minimum carbon footprint can be utilized in various temperatures for many applications, which can also in the lower temp uh, temperatures, or I can say for the direct use applications point of view, it can secure, uh, it can provide us food security and access to the fresh water. Not any other uh, energy resource provides such richness, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and the unique strength of geothermal also depends on its uh, characteristic that you can also integrate this with other energy resources. On the next slide, you can see uh, why the benefits that we can uh, get if we use geothermal for heating and cooling, for drying or for desalination. With all my apologies, I mean, I'm just passing a little fast. And in the uh, in my last slide, in the next one, uh, you can see how we can make it happen. How we made it happen in Turkey was uh, definitely in line with the uh, uh, support, a continuous support of the governments for the investors, which feed their appetite. Uh, a responsive uh, legislative structure. Uh, a governmental support is very critical to develop geothermal resources, as well as the R and D uh, the investment we need to do in R and D area, and disseminate the benefits and generate an increasing awareness within the uh, local communities. And we, as the human beings, need to stand up and ask for ourselves and the sake of our children. Uh, we need to say that we want geothermal uh, resources for a better. Uh, life quality. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, with all my apologies with this uh, voice issue, I need to keep it a little shorter. If you have any questions or require any clarifications, please do not hesitate to contact me and I will answer any of your questions as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Mrs. Janner, and thank you very much for being with us, uh, even in this condition. I'd like to thank you. Okay. Uh, as our next speaker, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Dilber Uzun Özşahin uh, to make her presentation. Professor, are you here? Yes, thank you so much, Mustafa. Can you please share the slide? Yes, we can see your slides now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Dilber Uzunusşahin from uh, University of Sharjah and Operational Research Center uh, in Near East University. Today, I will talk about application of fuzzy logic-based decision analysis in environmental engineering. Uh, first, I would like to mention our, our research center in Near East University, that is Operational Research and Integrated Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare and in University of Sharjah. What we do in our research center, actually we do, uh, we do uh, the drug resistance bacteria detection using artificial intelligence and decision analysis. We apply artificial intelligence and decision sciences to environmental health science in order to provide the support for hospitals, for engineers, for companies, for patients, and so on. Those are our group members. We are collaborating with Harvard Medical School, with University of Sharjah, and people from like uh, RGS University from the genetic, the medical genetics area. And then we do uh, collaborate people from the Madrid University College of uh, uh, College of Higher College of Technology from Dubai. And then we are collaborating uh, with Cornell Medicine. So he could, here you could see that our collaborators uh, are from all around the world. That is the hybrid and very uh, creative 
science actually we could apply because of the the various of our collaborators we can so what we do is to have uh, just give me one second just one second so first sorry for the okay First, let me talk about the methodology that we are using. It's called analytical multicriteria decision analysis. This is collection of information in order to evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of the alternatives according to different kind of criteria. This provides uh, some framework that you could think on it in order to solve complex problems into more manageable components and defining and understanding the relationship between those components, measuring for each component and combining them to identify solutions, actually. So these are the commonly used multi-criteria decision methodology that there is, I don't know what's going on. Uh, on in this in this writing, but I can tell you there is Topsis, there is Vicor, there is AHP, there is Promethe, Fuzzy Promethe, and so on. How we apply our methodology is we do use a pacification process in order to do to do the data creation. Then we do the defacification process using Jaeger index, and then we apply multi-criteria decision techniques, which we used it in this study I will show, it's promoting, basically. And then finally, we have results for the ranking. That is, the system is comparing each criteria in the video link, and then finally, it does the comparison of, of all general using different kind of preference functions. Mostly what we use here in this study is Gaussian function in order to have this ranking result because Gaussian uh, Gaussian function is is giving you more flexible, uh, more accurate result if you compare with the others. Okay, this is the fuzzy uh, scale, linguistic scale. So we have five different scale actually what we use in our system. Imagine that if the system it's not numerical, it provides you not numerical data. So what we do is to convert the, those data into fuzzy scale. So we use five scale here. For instance, if we pick very high information, the system will able to have it as a 0 0.75. So if we do set up our system as a high, then the system will have as a 0 0.5. If the system, sorry, as a 0 0.75, if the system will set up the, the, the parameters or criteria as a medium, the system will have it as a 0 0.5. For the low is 0 0.25, and then for very low is 0 0.025. Now, I would like to share you two different application of our techniques that you could you, you could think on it the this is the first one the preference ranking of gold monoparticle synthesizers methods using analytical decision making model so those are my colleague one of them is from operational resource center in nearest university it's one of our students actually phd students one of that uh, that is the ceo director of the of the center dr barna uzun is from she's from operational resource center and madrid university another one is dr ilker shine he's from also operational resource center and vale cornell medicine in the state so the aim of our uh, talk is that we will produce you the introduction, aim, material, and methodology in order to synthesize those gold nanoparticles that we need to combine all of four and then evaluate which are the best option in order to synthesize this technique. Now, this is the different application of gold nanoparticles used in diagnostic and therapy, as we discussed. So those are different shape of gold nanoparticles. So what we have done here is that we have checked all different kind of synthesizing methodology. There's chemical methods, 
physical methods, biological methods that each one have their own sub technique sub techniques actually for physical methods you have gamma irradiation like sonochemical uh, lithographic methods electrochemical photochemical and so on for the chemical methodologies you have the seeding ground chemical biosynthesis and we check all of them in order to evaluate and combine them and see what are the best option actually in order to uh, pick uh, for synthesizing gold nanoparticles. Now, I want you to imagine that you have 11 different alternatives, and then you have 16 different criteria. That criteria means that what make them important, such as toxicity, ease of use, uh, controllable mechanism, process time, cost, effects, uh, efficiency, dependency, purity, stabilizer. So you can combine all of those important criteria. And then uh, you can think of which option is the best one. So here you can imagine that you have 11 options, you have 16 criteria. It means that you have 11 by 16 matrices. So it's impossible, almost impossible to calculate by manually, like by hands, which option is the best option mathematically i'm talking so that is why we are using specific tools that in order to have the oh, okay thank you doctor so in order to see which is the best option now the aim of the study is to evaluate all of them as we have mentioned and then see which which are the the methodology is the best so what we have used is, is that multi-criteria decision analysis. So that is the, it has been established since 1970s. It is successfully used, in, especially in the econometry uh, field, but recently our, green, our team actually started to use for environmental and health science. So it's successfully used as user-friendly and it's very practical. So you have, this is just basic structure that I have put it. You have the aim, you have different criteria, and you have different alternatives. So all of those will give you the ranking. So the data that you are collecting could be numerical or non-numerical, like fuzzy based, like uncertain number. So we could combine both of that in the fuzzy primitive, and then we could have all of those results in order to the evaluation, the system performing. Those are the linguistic scale. As I have explained, that if the system will set up with the medium, that you could see the tail of medium start from 0 to 25 to 0 75. It means that the system will take as 0 5. If we set up our parameters as a high, and then the system will take you see the tail of high, it starts from 0, 0.5 to 1. So the system will have uh, the value as 0 0.75 and so on. Now, after collecting all of those information, we need to uh, have the, the expert opinion in order to rate their importance. For instance, so as you can know that, like, size is very important for producing the nanoparticles. So we set up as very important. Toxicity is very important for producing the nanoparticles, synthesizing it. So we set up as very high. But what we have done actually, we, we sit with the experts, so we have their opinion. So we, we set up all of those criteria according to their opinion, all right? And then finally, after collecting and uh, weighting them, the system expert should tell us that that which parameter, which criteria should be minimum, which criteria should be maximum. For instance, uh, the cost should be minimum, as you can guess. But the size, like the smallest size, the better for the synthesizing this uh, gold nanoparticles. That is why we set up as minimum. 
purity so should be maximum so we set up as maximum and so the radiation for instance the user's radiation should be minimal so we talk with the with the expert we set up as minimum now we set up all of those criteria individually and then finally we got the result according to our ranking result the biological synthesizers methods looks to be the best option the second one is sonochemical the third one physical the latest option looks to be like physiochemical uh, due to the their uh, criteria that we have evaluated we have weighted it and we maximize and minimize it all right then those are the results that because of the biological synthesizers is one of the best actually it's known as a green method because because of it has less toxicity high priority less processing time cost effectiveness and eco-friendly and so on okay so this is the second uh study actually i would like to share uh, as a second study that we used, evaluation of cement manufacturing methods using multi-criteria decision analysis. Those are my colleagues. You know Dr. Hussein by now. He is the chair of this conference, actually, from nearest University from Environmental Engineering. And uh, Nivin is his PhD student, and me, myself, and Dr. Berna from Operational Research Center and Madrid University. Now, this is the outline that uh, first we will talk about problem statement, cement manufacturing methodologies, advantages, pros and cons, and evaluation criteria, weightening, and technique we use. Finally, results and conclusion. Okay, cement is the most common material used in all construction and infrastructure projects for decades. So its environmental impacts resulting from cement manufacturing are dangerous. These impacts include emission of greenhouse gases, which cause global warming, resource depletion, air pollution, dust emission, which cause health problems in humans, and on the top of that, cement manufacturing is a heavy energy consuming industry in terms of heat and electrical power. So it's very important to evaluate cement production methodologies in order to, you know, have what are those all conflicting criteria and critical uh, decision. Now, there is different methodology. There's dry method. Semi-dry method, as you all know, semi-wet method and wet method. So what we have done is to evaluate them all and pick their all individual criteria. Criteria like what make them important, such as, like we will talk about material homogeneity, carbon dioxide emission, production cost, dust emission, quality of clinker, fuel consumption, processing time and the more criteria we put the better result we get it from the program all right so that is what we have now now so we set up all of those production methodologies and then all of these uh, chosen criteria based on all of these methodologies as we have talked and then we set up with the with the experts some opinion that the importance of weight, maximization and minimization. And then finally, we got the result that the dry methodology looks to be one of the best option, while semi-dry is second one, semi-wet is third one, and wet one is fourth one. This is the plot, actually, that it says that why the dry methodology looks to be best one and wet methodology looks to be worse one. So here you can see that in the below there is negative effects of all of these criteria for corresponding to those methodologies. And on the top you will see that all of those positive criteria corresponding to those methodologies. So for instance, for wet methodology, you see on the top the positiveness that material homogeneity, quality, dust emission, 
And in below, you have processing time, the negative effect, the producing cost, fuel consumption, carbon dioxide emission. So this is the reason actually why we are having this result. If we conclude, so we are successfully using these uh, techniques in order to model which option, which methodology is it's desirable and more optimal one actually. So in principle, you could think on collaborating and different projects that application, we are very open for collaboration as, a, as our research center. So we are very welcoming you. If you have my contact here everywhere, if you type my name, you will see my email. And so you can easily reach me and we are very happy to collaborate, all of you. So those are uh, the references. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Dilber Uzun Özşahin. Thank you so much. And as our next speaker uh, and last uh, presentation of this session, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Erdin Boskurt uh, to make his presentation. Mr. Boskurt, uh, welcome. Yes, I'm here. So can you share my if, file? Yes, if you can please share your file. Uh, well, I did Mr. actually. Uh, I did, and I'll just repeat once again. Is it coming? No, not not yet. Well, there should be something. Look, I'm trying to share it. Yeah, it's it's on slides now. I can see it. Okay, if you can share it on the StreamYard. Okay, is it with you yes, now? We, yes, we can Great. see now. Great. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I use laser? I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. Um, this time I will be talking about the case study, which is all about the structural controls on geothermal play types. What I'm going to do is to have a brief introduction to geothermal systems. This is for those who are not familiar with the geothermal. And in the second part of my talk, I will give some results of uh, research in different parts of Western Turkey. And finally, I will have a, a concluding remark. Well, um, if we just look at today's world, let's be sure that there is an increasing energy demand. Um, there is an increase in global fossil energy prices. And we have the negative effect of climate change over the past couple of decades. And, and all of these basically uh, is important to consider that environmentally friendly and sustainable green energy resources for power generation is really very important. In this regard, geothermal energy has played a very important role, not only in Turkey, actually, in many parts of the world, because some parts of the earth has very rich geothermal potential. Well, if we consider Turkey in this regard, over the last couple of decades, there are many uh, power plants which has been basically established. It's over 60 power plants. The installed power is really very large. There is a high amount of energy production during this time and the consumption, they, and the geothermal energy has a very important role in the consumption in Turkey. Well, if we just talk about what geothermal energy or what geothermal system is, actually, we can basically briefly define the system as convecting water in the uppermost part of the earth crust, which is confined in space and basically transfer heat from what is known as heat force source to a heat sinks. And actually, this is to the surface as well. This is how we define the geothermal system in general. And when we look at this system, there are three important elements and all have to be present in a successful system. There has to be a heat source, there has to be a reservoir, and there has to be a fluid which carries the heat um, and transfer the heat from the system. Let's have a look at some of those um, elements a little bit in detail. Well, heat, it has mainly two main sources. One of them is 
the heat which has been released from the intruding uh, magmas, they are usually very shallow magmas at a depth of about five, even to 10 kilometers. And the temperatures in and around, uh, around the, these intrusions is usually higher than 600 degrees. There are other systems. This is basically based on the geothermal gradient. And we know that geothermal gradient is around 30 degrees in general. But in such areas where geothermal, um, uh, geothermal systems present, the gradient is really very high. Accordingly, we classify the systems as basically, sorry, basically magmatic and, and amagmatic uh, geothermal systems. From the heat point of view, we have basically um, different schools with different classifications, but whatever the school is, whatever the criteria they, they use it, based on the heat of the systems, we classify the geothermal systems as low enthalpy, intermediate enthalpy, and high enthalpy systems. Uh, the, third, the, the, the third parameter, which is very important in the case of geothermal systems, is the presence of uh, what we call reservoir rock, this reservoir rock need to be hot. It has to be have high porosity and considerable amount of permeability because this is really quite important for fluids to circulate and extract heat from this reservoir. This reservoirs need to be um, have connection with the uh, surface area, which is known as recharge area, so that the meteoric waters can feed the system and to a successful a system that has to be a cover rock, which is impermeable um, and, and, and very effective on the system. Um, what kind of rocks would be the best reservoir? Actually, I will say that depending on various factors, any type of rock can be a reservoir, but normally uh, in our country, in Turkey, it's usually the limestones or marbles as the best ever um, reservoir rock I can count. Of course, for the system, you need to have a fluid, a hot fluid known as geothermal fluid. The source of this hot fluid is usually the meteoric water, okay, uh, which has been heated up and, and present in the system as liquid or vapor, depending on the temperature and pressure conditions. These hot fluids usually carries um, dissolved material as chemicals, and they have gases like carbon dioxide and sulfur gases. So how this system, I mean, if we have a proper system working with these major three elements, the mechanism of the system for a, for a successful um, geothermal system, the mechanism is really very important. And this mechanism usually involves faults from which the meteoric water is usually infiltrating downward along these fractures to the deeper parts of the earth into a kind of reservoir rock where it gets heated up and then using a very similar way, using the false state basically reach to the surface simply because heated water, heated fluids become low density and they have a tendency to move upward towards the surface. If we consider this system in terms of faults, so what we have, we have meteoric water, okay, which is infiltrating downward along these faults. Then they move downward. As they move downward along these faults or damage zones around these faults, where they get heated up from the, from the fault, then they leak into the very hot reservoir rock where they are getting hotter and hotter and from the reservoir rock, again, using similar path, using falls, they, this heated water will rise towards the earth's surface. If they can reach to the surface, they form what is known as hot geothermal springs. So understand, this means understanding of the falls, fault systems, and their relation to geothermal systems is crucial. So when we look at the world um, examples in general, we see that the structural settings, the fault patterns are crucial to understand. And what I'm going to do in the in the next two slides, try to illustrate which of the structural set settings are considered as most favorable uh, favorable for geothermal energy. 
uh, we have this kind of settings where the major faults basically terminate and branches into several segments or where the faults basically overstep or form what is known as relay ramps. They are very common along where the faults intersect or accommodate each other. Or we see these um, settings, favorable settings, where the faults basically have displacement transfer zones, especially in the case of strike city faults along Plopart basins. Or if the faults have relationship with the volcanic activity caldera collapse, the intersection of faults with the caldera margins. And if we have system associated with the magmatic activity, particularly if there are dikes, the tips of dikes usually considered as the most favorable places for geothermal plates. When we look at the worldwide examples, we see that the majority of the geothermal systems are associated with the step over or relay ramps in normal fault systems uh, along the tip of the normal fault systems or where the faults basically intersects. You can see that around 76% of the world's most famous geothermal fields are associated with these structural patterns. This means better understanding of the structural pattern in edge exploration forms one of the most important stages in exploration. So you may have this question, why faults are really very important? Simply because faults are associated with the intense deformation, which results in cracking, fragmentation of the rocks, formation of fractures. This, this, this basically results in high porosity and permeability, which is highly required for a reservoir rock in a geothermal systems. When we examine a particular fault or fault zones, we see that the damage zones are more effective along the tips of the faults. They are known as tip damage zones, or they may be effective along the walls of the faults, known as wall damage zones, and along the areas where the faults intersect, because these areas where the faults basically um, interact, we have local stress anomalies develop, which results in the formation of what is known as secondary porosity and permeability. So this means when we are studying in such zones, better understanding of the tip of the faults, where the faults usually terminate, or the intense deformation that takes place along the fault walls are crucial. But more importantly, the understanding of the structural pattern plays a very crucial role because fault damage zones where the rocks are highly crushed is being used as the conduits for fluids to percolate through and, and basically get heated up if they are moving towards the deeper parts of the system in general. So in these fault damage zones, which is being shown with this network symbol in this block diagram, uh, intense fracturing, formation of smaller faults and fractures, they all result in what is known as secondary porosity. The loss of cohesion along these fractures and faults results in permeability, which basically means the migration and discharge and eventually accumulation of the hydrothermal fluids into system, which then forms a, a better reservoir rock in general. So the damage zones of the faults usually regarded as the target zones in the geothermal exploration. Simply, they are flourish with secondary porosity. They have necessary permeability for the migration and accumulation of the fluids. As a result, they form better examples of what is known as fractured reservoirs. As a result, they have a high geothermal potential. So in such areas, the study of fault systems, understanding of fault networks, and, and understanding of their damage zones plays a crucial role in general. So this means characterization of the structural contours of geothermal systems in general is crucial in geothermal exploration. So if you look at this diagram, for example, this diagram clearly shows that although there are many faults in a given location, the localization of 
hot fluids, geothermal fluids, is only associated with one of those structures. So this means better understanding of the structural pattern is really crucial. According to you, will basically design your project. So what are the steps in a successful exploration? That is the crucial um, uh, uh, stage in the exploration. First of all, there has to be a well-organized, professional, and really careful approach. And the method which has been selected for exploration should be a tailor-made method because every system, every region have its own characteristics and the method you apply should comply with the concession area, with the license area you are working. Uh, so the development of a suitable exploration strategy forms a very important stage. There has to be a strategic and stepwise approach. And don't forget, you may start with one strategy, you may have many steps being defined, but during the course of exploration, there has to be revision of your method, your steps, because this is a dynamic um, uh, process. And in this dynamic process, the new data may basically necessitate the alteration of the methods you have to uh, you, you apply. Also, integration, successful integration of field-based geological and geophysical studies is also very crucial, simply because we try to develop a three-dimensional model, and to develop this model, the information from the geophysical data is really crucial. So, Characterization of potential reservoir rocks, which is possibly hosting the hot fluids. Characterization of geological structures, which are not observed on the surface, simply they are buried, blind. And development of the 3D conceptual structure model forms a very important stage. The geothermal exploration is a very expensive uh, process. So we should remember the cost of exploration and also both exploration and production well bores. Eventually, we need to develop a 3D conception model. This conception model is based on the field geological mapping, geophysical data. They all involve, for example, fault stress analysis, the interaction between the faults, the study of reservoir rocks, stratigraphy of the given region and we need to develop a kind of potential map for the, for the geothermal systems from which all we need to develop a 3d conception model and as new data is adding into the system we also need to revise this conception model because this is a dynamic model living model okay so what i will do from this point of view i will show you some case studies where we applied all these uh, steps from uh, from Turkey, in particular from Western Turkey. Those who are not familiar with the geology of Turkey, let me uh, emphasize some of the most important structural elements. One of them is the North Anatolian Fault Zone, which is a right lateral intracontinental transform fault, which basically cross cut Anatolia all the way from east to the west. The second one is the East Anatolian Fault Zone, which is a left lateral intracontinental transform fault. The third one is a Dead Sea transform fault, which is a, again a sinister fault and forms the boundary between African plate to the west and Arabian plate to the east. We have an important collusional zone between Arabian plate to the south and Eurasian plate to the north. And lastly, we have a region where the African plate is basically subducting northward beneath the Anatolian plate, so we have subduction and, and basically related processes. In this regard, Western Turkey, where mostly the normal faults forms the most important structural elements, actually is considered and as, as one of the best locations in the world to study and understand the extensional tectonics, and in this regard to understand the geothermal plays and their structural role. So in this um, part of Turkey, there are Grabans, east-west trending Grabans. Büyük Menderes Graben and Gediz Graben forms one of the most important ones. Here, 
these two graphons are flourish with geothermal plates. They are considered as non-magmatic, fault controlled, and intermediate to high enthalpy geothermal systems. They are mostly controlled by the normal faults or fault zones, where the geometry, interaction, and intersection of faults and the final structural style or pattern of the faults forms the most important control on the um, geology and geothermal systems. So, establishment of fault geometry and better understanding of the structural pattern in a given concession in Western Turkey is highly desired. Let me introduce a little bit more in detail about the geology of Western Turkey, in particular when the structural features are concerned. There are three main fault types occurs in the region. One of them is the low angle normal faults. They are regarded as north uh, detachment faults. One of them is in the north, which is named as Simav detachment. The other one is in the south of the Geddes Graben. It is named as Geddes detachment fault. There is one along the Büyük Menderes Graben. It's named as Büyük Menderes detachment fault zone. And there is one shear zone to the south. In between, we have basically normal uh, normal fault controlled grabens and Büyük Menderes Graben and Geddes Graben forms one of the most important structural elements. All these grabens, as I say, is controlled by high angle normal faults. Between or in the foot wall of these detachment faults, the metamorphic rocks of the, the Menderes Massif has been exhumed very quickly and dramatically. And that's, that's why Menderes Massif is considered as core complex, which is one of the most um, important and largest core complexes in the world. Geothermal systems are mainly concentrated along the northern margin of the Büyük Menderes Graben and along the southern margin of the Geddes Graben. We have many areas being studied along these, these areas, sorry, along these Grabens, and I will be showing you two examples from the Büyük Menderes Graben. These Grabens are important for geothermal systems because there are very large scale normal faults in the systems. They, they are proven to control the fluid circulation in the region. And basically they have a, a strong correlation with the occurrence of geothermal plays and hot water springs in the systems. What I'm gonna do next is to show you some of the examples of those structural elements to you, because in my opinion, they form the beautiful structures um, of detachment faults. For example, this one is a Google Earth image of detachment fault, which controls the southern margin of the Graben. You can observe, touch the fault um, uh, uh, along several kilometers along their strike and several kilometers along their dip direction. So this is a relatively close-up view of the detachment fault. There are villages on the detachment fault. In the hanging vault, there are Miocene sediments. In the foot vault, there are highly uh, deformed metamorphic rocks. This is another example of a detachment fault, which is a very low angle structure in here. In the foot vault, there are deformed metamorphic rocks. In the hanging vault, there are dipping Miocene sedimentary rocks. This fault has a dip angle usually less than 20 degrees. In places, they are almost horizontal structures. These detachment faults are cut by high angle normal faults, which controls the grabbins in the region. And here are some examples of detachment, uh, high angle normal faults. In this particular slide, this is the fault itself. Here we have Miocene sediments, which are tipping towards the fault. And in the foot wall, there is metamorphic rocks. This is a high angle normal fault, which forms within the Miocene sediments. And then there are very good examples of such falls in this region. That is why Western Turkey is one of the key localities on earth to study these falls. In some places, fault planes of high angle normal faults are very well exposed. And here in three diagrams, you see very good examples of fault planes in different parts of Western Turkey. And as I say, these faults are highly um, dissecting the region and basically defining a, 
very characteristic structure pattern, which forms a suitable location for geothermal resources. Apart from these low angle faults and normal faults, there are north-south trending strike seal faults. We name them as transfer faults. And our recent research has clearly uh, shown that these north-south transfer faults are very important and crucial structures in controlling the formation of geothermal systems in general. And we can map these structures as very large scale structures. For example, this is a view from the Geddes Graben where two large scale transfer faults dissect the gravel into three sub basins. This is the interpretation of a seismic section along this line, actually, which shows that this strike slip fault is really very characteristic in the system. So these three structural elements are really very crucial for a better understanding of these structures. And as you can see, this map from the uh, southern margin of the Alashir Graben uh, plays a very, uh, displays a very characteristic view of the um, uh, Grabens, illustrating that there are low angle detachment faults, which is this funny irregular pattern. There are high angle normal faults that basically bounce the Graben, and there are not almost north south trending strike silly faults that basically forms a transfer between different fault segments. So what we have done, we have studied several um, locations along the uh, Geddes Graben and along the Buick Menderes Graben. And I will be showing you some examples from our research. And the data that I'm going to present in here is coming from the surface geological mapping interpretation of geophysical data, mainly magnetic telluric data, and in some cases we have borehole data. So calibration of ge geophysical data with borehole information, integration of all these um, data from surface and geophysical data uh, basically led us to interpret some of those geothermal systems. So what I'm going to do is I will take you to Western uh, Turkey, to Büyük Menderes Graben, and, and, and we are looking at an area which is very close to, or west of the Aydın region. So as I say, we have performed in um, detailed geological mapping of this area, defined different rock units. We have mapped falls and, and, and other geological structures which may have an important influence on the geothermal system developments. And as you can see, similar to general characteristics of Western Turkey, there are high angle normal faults and there are northeast trending strikes in the faults as the major structural elements. We have also studied, especially within the Graban itself, an area uh, and we perform geophysical data. I have, this is uh, one of those horizon maps of uh, this uh, MT data, which is at a depth of um, 850 below Earth's surface. This is what the anomalies look like based on the surface mapping, our experience in the region. We interpreted such uh, horizon maps. So this is an interpretation of these horizon maps, which are interpreted especially to understand the, uh, the presence, role of strike silly faults in the system. All these red lines shows the strike silly faults. We have also interpreted sections which are parallel to the uh, normal faults and perpendicular to the normal faults. For example, this is uh, uh, two sections which are basically designed to interpret the normal faults. And you can see that normal faults controls the empty geophysical anomalies very well. They are also basically cal uh, calibrated with the surface mapping. And you can see that all these anomalies uh, have, a, have a strong correlation with the fault and fault geometry. To understand the strike silly faults, we also have sections perpendicular to the um, normal faults. And here you can see that these anomalies shows clearly the presence of high angle strike silly faults that basically have a crucial role in the formation of geothermal systems. And finally, we have combined all this data and eventually ended up with a model where we may say that, um, or we may define some target areas. As you can see, 
the strike seal force particularly results results in the compartmentalization of the uh, of the prospect let's put it this way and and there are in this particular locality we define three pro prospects and from the other information we basically designed the project and defined where possibly we shall drill and and and, and develop the project then we move to the south of the graben and studied a different prospect around Kocharlı. Again, there is a, a very detailed mapping, surface mapping of the prospect and, and surroundings. And again, we see evidence of normal faulting and we see evidence for strike slip faulting. To test these models and also to see what the structures look like within the gravel because they are buried, we performed empty studies. This is one of those empty Empty, empty horizons and as you can see um, there is this low resistivity zone when you make the interpretation of these features we basically find out that there are characteristic or let's put this way some of the strike seal faults we mapped in the prospect can be traceable within the buried graben and and basically we develop a, a, a structural map of those horizon maps we interpreted uh, basically sections, and again, you can see that the resistivity anomalies have a close relationship with the maps, with the false map during the field uh, geology, and and also along these um, east-west profiles, we also see evidence of strike seal faulting, which is very characteristic. Finally, again, we develop a structural model, which clearly shows that there are not south strike slip faults with some normal components and there are many uh, normal faults in the system and this structural pattern actually forms a very good uh, reservoir for the strike slip faults and then we develop this model where the compartments have been defined and we, we we said that among these compartments one of them is most promising so we basically drilled and 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 eventually we located the fact that the mapping from the surface geology and from the geophysical data is working perfectly well. So we, we have defined basically the presence of this uh, strike seal fault, which results in compartmentalization and basically has been used as a pathway for the fluids. Well, to understand the system as a whole, we know that there are other works in the region and, and they have borehole data. So along this section, we combine the borehole data and we make an interpretation of it. And this uh, borehole data uh, is being correlated. And this correlation has shown the fact that Büyük Menderes Graben is being dissected by several strikes of the falls, which resulted in the formation of compartments and also north-south trending horse and graben structures within the graben itself. Um, and this is really very important and crucial to spot because we don't see any surface evidence of these, but we combine geophysical surface mapping and borehole data and finally ended up with the fact that especially these intersection zones forms the most important targets for geothermal resources and many of the um, geothermal uh, power stations are actually using the, this, this, these, these zones as the production zones anyway. Um, uh, we also studied many different parts along the Büyük Menderes Graben and, and, and basically uh, I will be just mentioning some of them very quickly because I don't want to take your time too long. This is from uh, Alashehir area, here you can see basically and you see that again there is very detailed surface mapping uh, and from this area we have empty data so we interpreted this empty data as horizon maps as you can see here we define the transfer fault which has been basically mapped during the uh, during the field mm -hmm. studies this is the interpretation of this um, uh, horizon map which indicates the presence of a strike seal fault and other faults in the system this is another horizon map which justifies that this fault really exists and can penetrate deep into the mm -hmm. earth um, it's it cross itself. This is the interpretation of that anomaly map. So we studied north-south sections mm -hmm. to understand the normal faults. 
these anomalies are perfect. They really correlate well with the field data. Um, the only uh, information that is very questionable is not the location of the faults, but the geometry, particularly dip of the faults. And, and this is the interpretation of many of the um, anomalies, empty data. So we define a horse and gravel structure, which is not observable in the field because it has been buried. We also have some information from the gravel itself. This gravel is highly cultivated. There is a lot of activities. It's very difficult to understand the presence of faults, to understand the lithology at depth. The only information comes from geophysical data. And these are some of the horizon maps from this small concession area. The anomalies are perfect and they can be well correlated with the structures. So we defined, for example, these structural faults in the region. We also interpreted geophysical uh, cross sections. This is for normal faults. You can see that the anomaly distribution shape and even displacement of those anomalies, which corresponds to different lithologic associations is very well observed along these sections. This also clearly shows the power of geophysical data, but I would like to emphasize one thing is that quality of your interpretation is totally based on the quality of the geophysical data, the quality of the process of geophysical data and the geophysical model, which has been basically defined. That is why this geophysical studies has to be done after the geological mapping and in, in basically consultation with the geologists working in the region. So finally, we interpreted this pattern in the, in the, within the graben using the geophysical information. Again, similar pattern, strikes the falls, normal falls, their intersection and interaction forms the beautiful, beautiful settings for geothermal systems. And they basically resulted in the formation of um, successful projects. I will take you to the Buick Menderes Graben. Again, this is a, a, a really very successful project. Again, interpretation of the geophysical data cross sections. And these are the boreholes through these sections. And all of these boreholes are successful, successful boreholes. That's what I would like to emphasize. And they are basically based on the structural model, which has been devised by surface mapping and geophysical data. Location depth of all of these fault, uh, boreholes has been designed accordingly. And for example, you can have um, oriented boreholes and these oriented boreholes has to be uh, basically designed according to the structural pattern. And you can see that this is one of those successes boreholes which has been designed according to the structural pattern. The structural faults are easy to define along these as well. And again, as you can see, these are successful boreholes. And, and basically, they, these, these red line shows basically, that area shows basically the production areas for the boreholes. Structural pattern is, is crucial to design the boreholes, to, to, to decide the location of the boreholes, and they are very characteristic. So you can see that structural pattern is the prime control for a successful geothermal exploration. To sum up, for, for the Menderes, uh, for the Western Turkey case, we see, we see that there are low angle normal faults, there are east-west trending high angle normal faults that basically control and bounce the uh, gravels, and there are not sought, almost not sought trending high angle strike seal faults in the system. The intersection interaction of these fault systems forms the best ever locations for geothermal exploration. Uh, of course, I would like to confess one of the major things that um, until these detailed studies about the geothermal systems, the better understanding of the presence of north-south strike seal faults and their role in both development of the extensional tectonics and geothermal systems were not well understood by us. But now we, we realize that north-south trending sub-vertical strike seal faults are really crucial because they basically control the geothermal systems in this region, basically resulting in the compartmentalization of the grabbins and individual compartments are considered as the target areas for further exploration. And we know that especially in these tectonic settings, 
the intersection of Graben bounding faults and the transfer faults, as it is illustrated in this diagram, forms the best ever locations for geothermal plays. And in fact, they also localize where the geothermal springs appear in, the, in general. If we want to conclude, what I would like to emphasize is the fact that these north-south trending faults in Western Turkey is really very important. That is why uh, we are working on the better understanding of why and where these strike silly faults may form, what controls their formation, and what is their role in evolution of the extensional tectonics. So we perform field studies, but in the meantime, we perform um, numerical models for the better understanding of geological structures in general. This is all I can say. And if you have any question, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Mr. Boskurt, for your valuable presentation. You're welcome. You're welcome. And this was the end of uh, the second day, second session presentations. Uh, shortly after, we will be continuing with the third session uh, of the second day. Thank you very much. I'm catching a bus, never feeling a swimming.